1903. The Chosen. On the night of February 12, 1903, a long line of carriages made its way through the imperial gates of St. Petersburg's Winter Palace. The great mansion, which stretched for three miles along the now frozen Neva River, blazed with light. Its massive crystal and gold chandeliers reflected a hundred times in the mirrored walls of its cathedral-sized reception rooms. The light cast a welcoming glow that contrasted sharply with the snow and ice outside. Bundled in sable, ermine, or mink wraps, the passengers alighted. Bracing themselves against the icy wind howling off the Gulf of Finland, they hurried through the arched doorway. Inside, the strains of the court orchestra greeted them. Masses of fresh roses, lilacs, and mimosas imported just for the night from the south of France perfumed the air. Handing their furs to the waiting footmen, guests paused in front of the pier glass to straighten silk skirts and pat pomaded hair into place before ascending the wide marble staircase to the second floor. A series of halls, each more grand than the last, met the guests. Gilded ceilings and doorways, columns of malachite and jasper, white marble statues. Through these rooms, the guests wandered, plucking flutes of champagne from silver trays, clapping each other on the back, laughing, joking, gossiping. They felt completely at ease in their opulent surroundings. That's because they were members of the nobility, the 870 families known in Russia as the Bilia Coast, literally meaning white bone, or what we would call blue blood. Holding titles like prince and princess, duke, baron, count, and countess, the Bilia Kos represented only 1.5% of the population, but owned 90% of all Russia's wealth. Educated and sophisticated, many of them could trace their family roots all the way back to the ancient princes who had ruled the country centuries before. And most lived lives of incredible luxury that were, recalled one princess, a natural part of existence. They built summer and winter palaces filled with fine antiques and priceless objects d'art, ordered designer gowns from Paris, vacationed in Italy or on the French Riviera, and spoke English or French, but seldom Russian because it showed a lack of breeding. Privileged from birth, the Bilia Kost socialized only with each other. They belonged to the same clubs, attended the same parties, frequented the same shops, restaurants, and salons. Above all, they possessed an unshakable belief in their own superiority. As one member of the upper crust explained, nobles had a certain quality of being among the chosen, of being privileged, of not being the same as all other people. Tonight, they felt especially chosen. Weeks earlier, the court runner had hand-delivered a stiff villum card embossed with the imperial insignia, the gold double-headed eagle, to their palaces. It was an invitation from Tsar Nicholas II, an invitation to a ball. St. Petersburg's upper crust buzz. Even though the imperial couple was traditionally the center of society, Nicholas and Alexandra detested the social whirl. They rarely threw receptions or balls, preferring to remain in seclusion. This, however, was such a grand occasion, the 200th anniversary of St. Petersburg's founding as the Russian capital, that even the party-shunning royal couple could not ignore it. And so Nicholas was throwing a costume ball. Guests were told to come dressed in 17th century garb. Giddy with excitement, the nobility flocked to dressmakers and tailors, where they spent fortunes on gold silk tunics, caftans, edged in sable, and headdresses studded with rubies and diamonds.